preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. My name is Laura Kaminsky. As Associate Director of Education for the Humanities at the 92nd Street Y, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this third evening of our 1984-85 series, The Shape of the City, Architects, Their Buildings and Their Visions. Regarding the format this evening, following the moderated conversation on stage, members of the audience will be able to submit written questions on the index cards which you received as you entered the hall. During the next hour, please write your questions on these cards and pass them to the center aisles where ushers will collect them and bring them backstage for presentation. I'd like to just make a brief interjection here. Uh, last week, our guest was Richard Meyer. At that time, Mr. Meyer was one of three finalists for the J. Paul Getty Trust Commission to design an extensive new arts complex in Los Angeles. Mr. Meyer has since been selected for the project, which I'm sure most of you know, and we'd like to offer him our congratulations on this enormous achievement. Um, now on to this evening. Paul Goldberger's guest this evening, Helmut Jan, was born in Nuremberg, Germany. He graduated from the Technische Hochschule in Munich and then came to the United States to pursue his graduate studies at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Mr. Hyun remained in Chicago after his studies as an associate of C.F. Murphy. Since 1981, he has served as president of Murphy Yan Architects. Mr. Yan has been credited with changing the shape of Chicago's skyline. Among his completed Chicago projects are the additions to the Mercy Hospital and the Chicago Board of Trade, one South Wacker office building, and the area to police headquarters. Buildings in, prog in progress include the O'Hare Rapid Transit Station, the State of Illinois Center, Northwestern Terminal, the Greyhound Terminal Project, and the O'Hare Airport Expansion Program. Mr. Yan's contributions to the New York Cityscape are 425 Lexington Avenue, the Park Avenue Towers. He has several major projects in West Germany, Texas, Wisconsin, and throughout the state of Illinois. Mr. Yan has won several AIA National Honor Awards, Illinois Council Awards, and Chicago Chapter Awards, as well as numerous Progressive Architecture Awards, uh, the Ashray Energy Awards, the AISC Awards, the Owens Corning Fiberglass Energy Conservation Award, and in 1982, the Arnold W. Brunner Memorial Prize in Architecture. Mr. Yan has served as the Elliott Noyes Visiting Design Critic at Harvard and the Davenport Visiting Professor of Architectural Design at Yale. He lectures and juries at various universities and professional societies worldwide. We are honored to have Mr. Yan with us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our moderator, Mr. Paul Goldberger, and our guest, Mr. Helmut Jan. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to you, Helmut Jan. Uh, I'm glad that you all are back for the third evening in this series. As we did last week, we're going to begin not with words but with pictures. Helmut Jan has brought a small selection of slides which he'll run through very quickly just to give you a kind of set of reference points about some of the things that we'll be coming back to and discussing at more leisure as the evening goes on. So before I say another word, why don't we dim these and uh, move over to slides. This was the second slide I had. I hope uh, they are in better sequence. No, no, this is wrong. No. Can we go backwards? Can, can, we, can we start out from the beginning? It, obviously, this is all wrong in there. OK, here we go. Uh, there's actually two building types. Uh, I always uh, separated from each other until recently. Uh, 
and uh, this were the low buildings we did, which I always refer to as mad buildings, and the tall buildings we did. This is the first building uh, which uh, really incorporated a lot of the thoughts we, we uh, uh, had at that particular time. That building was done about 10 years ago. It's the St. Mary's Athletic Facility. And uh, this is a composite of ideas about structure, about servicing, about cladding, and about the use of light. Uh, in, the, in its essential way, it's a very technical composition of, uh, uh, in the synthesis of those uh, elements of a building which deal with construction and technology and with, its, with the building's function. Uh, in the Kemper Arena in Kansas City, the, the predominant idea was the structure and it was also uh, a more formal effort in actually also separating the structure uh, from the room enclosing elements. Uh, quite a, uh, this is a very recent project and this makes a big step. This is the expansion of O'Hare Airport. This is the United Airlines terminal. This is a partial model of the interior of the building. And uh, so very similar elements are used in this building Technology has become not the primary element here, but technology is used to serve other purposes. And uh, there, there are social purposes and intellectual purposes and aspects of meaning in this building. Uh, above all, it's the idea of creating a really truly public building in an airport terminal, uh, something reminiscent of the great arcades and the railroad stations of uh, the past and getting rid somewhat of uh, uh, the concourse-like, basement-like feelings which many airport terminals have. And the, these associations uh, with those past building forms which uh, become an overriding element and the use of the technical and the structural element serves those overriding purposes. Uh, on another low-rise building, uh, uh, this one is in a suburb of Chicago in Evanston, uh, the element of uh, of uh, uh, the urban interface of the building becomes uh, uh, dominant and an F and another aspect affecting the design and the visual appearance of this building. Uh, this is a building in a building. There's an outer building, which is the contextual element, both in form and materials, making the relationship to the more traditional fabric of the city with the new building growing out of it. Uh, in the urban buildings, uh, Xerox Center made at the beginning. Uh, Paul used to call this building uh, a computer aesthetic. It's been called everything from slick tech to uh, neo Mendelsonian. It was essentially uh, uh, an effort to also create a, 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 on a very important urban space a transition between the street and a large plaza, and reinforcing this formal gesture with a transformation of the facade. Uh, on subsequent buildings, uh, other elements emerged. Uh, the One South Wagger building, uh, using same constructional techniques, makes a more uh, direct relationship in its setback configuration, the stepped arch, and uh, the decorative use of those technical elements, they infill with different classes to some of the Art Deco buildings of the previous time. So not in a literal way, but in an abstracted way. Uh, on the Board of Trade, uh, this relationship is uh, formally quite literal, but in terms of its materials, it's abstracted. The stone building transforms into glass, so the form of the old building is the metaphor for the new building. Uh, another aspect which uh, emerges in this part of this uh, urban buildings is the aspect of public space in these buildings. This is the atrium of the Board of Trade, which then uh, again in its high technology and construction techniques uh, serves an overriding purpose of creating an image of the uh, steel and iron buildings of the past above its uh, social purpose of being uh, enclosed urban space. Uh, 
the State of Illinois Center uh, uses the reference to uh, the large government buildings with rotundas, an abstracted dome, and uh, uh, also a very complex urban relationship together with uh, uh, the, uh, the idea of a civic enclosed urban space which is full of activity and uh, in its function then incorporates also shops in the building. Uh, on a smaller building in Milwaukee, again, the, the Galleria is an urban space. Uh, this is building is under construction, the Northwestern Terminal Building. Uh, the art, uh, uh, modern idea relationship to the streamlined object of the trains, the urban gateway, the large arch, also a Chicago Sullivan-esque tradition, abstraction of uh, those various ideas. Uh, the 701 building in Minneapolis, uh, uh, another a high-rise version of this idea of a building in the building, the liner which uh, relates contextually uh, to the surroundings with the pristine office building inside it, building kind of changing as you, as you go around it. Uh, a similar version is under construction in uh, South Africa where the, where the, the, the spiral is uh, uh, a more dynamic element, uh, again making the transition from the, from the varied urban fabric to the top of this tower. Uh, this other building in South Africa, the idea of the, the diamond is an appropriate relationship to the culture and the economy of this country uh, connected with, uh, with the image of a tall skyscraper inscribed on it. The, the Bank of Southwest in Houston, the obelisk as a, as a, 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 a symbolic representation of something and you know, a connoting achievement and glory, which is probably what those tall buildings are ultimately about. Uh, with a base making uh, a public space in the uh, varied levels of transition, spatial transition to the urban uh, streetscape. Uh, this is uh, several New York projects. Uh, this is Park Avenue Tower under construction, a mid-block building, the building with two fronts, then turning into a building with four sides on the top with an open pyramid uh, and uh, obviously certain uh, relationships uh, in, 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 uh, with to the AT&T building. Uh, this is the, uh, another the building next to the Chrysler building. Uh, the idea of the column, the building actually without a top, uh, is a reference. And this is the city center project next to the city center theater. Uh, uh, a combination of two elements, a step back octagon with uh, a slab, uh, different size wings uh, protruding through it, uh, obviously in relationship to the new midtown zoning and uh, an effort to reduce the bulk of the building and uh, the dome and obvious reference and uh, creating a dialogue with the city center theater. Uh, this is a project in Philadelphia little New York import for Philadelphia. It's a, a, a whole city block development with one existing building, four, four buildings on each corner, two office buildings and a hotel and a large retail area, obviously in the early design phases. A building in Los Angeles, again, the intertwining of two elements, the column and the slab, uh, uh, creating a, an image uh, which uh, which uh, gives the building its uh, primary visual appearance. Uh, uh, and this is a, a recent project in Chicago next to the Civic Center, dual office building project, which a large retail mall. Again, the, uh, the uh, a, a round tower uh, uh, protruding out of a slab uh, is, a, is the primary formal idea in this building.
thank you. Um, what a shame you don't have any work. It's really... Uh, I didn't have anything better to do tonight to <laughs> talk here. Right. Um, one, one question that some of this work raises for me, or one initial question or place to start, um, it seems to me that you seem to unite two strands or strains that we're used to seeing as being pretty separate and exclusive in architecture right now. They, the movement toward what you called high tech, or sort of a very sleek uh, technological imagery and historicist imagery. I mean, a lot of your buildings are frankly historicizing, uh, but they seem to do so not in the sort of Philip Johnson way of heavy stone and trying to do it almost more literally, uh, much more in the way of using modern materials and still retaining that sense of sleekness and that sense of high tech. Is that a conscious desire to pull together two strands? Well, some of it actually uh, to a strict necessity. I mean, we never had uh, a client uh, to actually pay for putting all that stone in a building. <laughs> and uh, I, I actually think that our work comes out of really pretty pragmatic requirements. And, uh, uh, but I think there's an underlying uh, common denominator in the use and the variation of these materials. And this is why I always make a point of showing actually this low mat type buildings first, because I think these are the buildings actually where at least I learned those tools which I can later manipulate on those mm -hmm. tall buildings. And, uh, and uh, our work is probably not so much informed by uh, uh, a desire to kind of establish an intellectual uh, rationale for a direction in architecture. I think our work has really grown out, out of what architecture is actually really about and what I deeply believe in, of solving problems. And uh, I think as the problems become sometimes more complex, the solutions become more, uh, more complex. And uh, I actually like uh, uh, problems which, uh, which actually do require uh, this ultimate merging of these necessities, whether they are caused by the site, whether they are caused by the budget or by the code or certain wishes on the client, with our own ideas about uh, architecture. And I think those uh, necessities of responding to sometimes one or all those circumstances have actually created this kind of architecture, which I hope at the end does have, uh, after all, a continuity. So it's formally quite diverse. It, it, it is actually the constructional principles which, uh, which are the underlying factor, not so much the formal ones. And as I just explained, and obviously in the course of explaining those buildings, I find myself less talking about those construction necessities, but I'm talking about the image and the symbolic qualities of these buildings. But it should not be understood that this is actually the one and foremost thing on our mind. That's probably the last thing on our mind. But because I think we've learned how to manipulate technology and to make it work for those various visual attempts. Good. What, what would you define as the problem, say, in something like, oh, to pick one at random, the Philadelphia project, where we have three little Chrysler buildings, or three things that are heavily derivative of the Chrysler building, uh, is that actually solving a problem to come up with something that, with that strong a historical reference? Well, I mean, actually, I actually think, uh, I've got to go a little further back. When we did the Bank of Southwest, everybody actually said that the Bank of Southwest looked like the Chrysler building. And right. uh, I think even uh, Paul, I think I did, too, actually. Paul did say that, too. You know, so if you actually look close to in the Bank of Southwest, uh, there's probably nothing like the Chrysler building, except maybe this remote resemblance of those horizontal bands right, right. on the corners. But in terms of its shape, its setback, its top, uh, there was actually no relationship. But it shows you actually, actually what a problem is in criticism, how you explain actually somebody you know, uh, of what something is like. Now, 
this is mm. actually not the final phase right now and the building actually has right, changed right. a little bit and, and I actually think that that building looks just as much as the Bank of Southwest as it does like mm. the Chrysler building. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's true, although... And, although, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and so I actually got, probably because so many people said that the Bank of Southwest looked like the Chrysler building, I actually got consciously interested so you, you uh, and I had that book out of the Chrysler building, and I knew you couldn't do it like this, but and there isn't actually anything on that roof like the Chrysler building, right. but, but it, it is a resemblance. Now, what also, I think, made the Chrysler uh, roof, I think, something which was interesting for me, because the first building is about a million two hundred thousand square feet, and the second building is 900,000 square feet. So they're almost the same size, but they're really not quite the same. And it turned out to be a very difficult problem of how to actually relate those almost identical buildings, trying to obviously give the first one a prominence and making the second one not look like a scaled down version of that one. And so this principle actually, what that roof actually is, is just like the, the roof of the Bank of Southwest actually pulled out three more times, you know, somewhat like, a, uh, like a, out of a box. And, uh, and uh, I am actually not really worried that it's ultimately going to look like this. I don't think it, like, I don't think like anything wrong with it if it does. Yeah. It's not, it's not and, necessarily a value judgment. It's just and, a and actually, question. I'm a, yeah. uh, I tested actually a lot of people out. I mean, I, you know, we, we, like always, we had like four or five designs. And uh, I actually made a point to show people through the office and actually have them react. And uh, uh, mm -hmm. because the... Uh, there is no doubt that when you deal with an image of a building and in a relationship of a building like this building tries to do with some of the buildings in the past, uh, that, that there is a point when, uh, when it be, can be categorized as an outright copy of something. Uh, I am personally not worried that it's going to be an outright copy because I think it's going to have this element of incorporating techniques and materials and the relationship of those materials. The forms are going to be modified by the necessities of those materials, how to deal with it. And I tend to believe that the building ultimately will be a, a, you know, a statement which is true to the, to, to the capabilities of, of, of and the technology of our time, but at the same time reminiscent, which is really the basic uh, idea behind those buildings of a period in skyscraper design where there was somewhat a little bit more romance, there was a little bit more fantasy, there was this element of surprise and this element of will, uh, and style if you want to call sure. it, uh, which, uh, which uh, used to be considered uh, not serious and, and not acceptable within the strong dogma of the modern movement. An era of kind of passion and exuberance, really, I think, uh, yeah. is, is true. Yeah. Well, then, I think we come back to that point I started with, then, of trying to merge two strains that are very often thought of as distinct. The interest, the impulse toward historical form and the impulse toward modern materials and technology. Let me, since we're on the subject of the Chrysler Building, ask you, about the building that you're doing that's going up just north of the Chrysler building. Yeah. Um, there you have an interesting, now that we're at a moment in our culture in which the Chrysler building is view, is to skyscrapers, or is generally believed to be to skyscrapers, in a position roughly equal to that of Chartres and cathedrals. Um, what do you do if you're asked to build a skyscraper next door. I mean, is that a position not unlike that of a church architect asked to put up another church in the village of Shark? I mean, how, how, how did you evolve a design that, in this case, obviously, is quite deliberately distinct and different from the Chrysler building? Well, this building came out of a limited competition, right. like so many of us buildings do, and, uh, and the, the program actually changed a couple of times in the course of the competition, but the essential requirement was really to design a building uh, a low building, maximizing the floor size and uh, making an ass of rights building, complying to the new midtown zoning. And, 
there was at one point we made a, uh, you know, after making various tries, we made a deliberate decision that we're actually going to do, uh, which just sounds like almost a very radical thing today, you know, doing a building without a top. Uh, and I found actually this after making massing studies and uh, you know, seeing actually the size of the building next to the Chrysler building, which is even less than half, that, that this was an appropriate response uh, in terms of the urban condition. Mm -hmm. To not do a top. Right, and the, the column, the, the, the analogy with the column uh, you know, seemed to be uh, uh, a kind of an image which I think gave you uh, 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 an, an image to, to the, the building without actually trying to go in rivalry with right. the Chrysler building. It also gives you actually some aspect, a, a real presence on the streetscape because it actually forms some of the roof over the street. And uh, it's incidentally actually somehow uh, we missed about the skylight exposure curve by about six inches, you know, which, uh, which uh, you know, somewhat uh, yeah. limits bulk, and it's actually in spirit somewhat against the zoning, which tries yeah, to reduce which deals the, in, in narrowing the, 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 the building, but the developer liked it because he saw they could really rent those top floors for a little bit more because, you know, you, you actually uh, somewhat uh, cantilever out over the street, and it gives you a uh, a, a new uh, sensation and a different feeling, which is, I think, something which has to be considered when you talk about the skyscraper is, is that, that you're not really, uh, with developers doing skyscrapers today, that you're really not your own judge or you're not really in control of all the things you do, that you respond to a marketplace and uh, that it is commercial architecture, somewhat that it's, it, it's uh, it's its clearest, and uh, and uh, you have to find a way how to to uh, to merge your architectural ideas with the necessities of the marketplace economy, and uh, and I think it's that that uh, interplay, the successful interplay of the two which you achieve, it makes the success of uh, of those buildings. I think that's right. Although I, I would also say I think that that's not new, to, the challenge is not new to this time. I mean, the, that merging is something that every generation has had to, has had to do. I guess yeah, the unusual thing I now is... The, 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 the interesting thing is always when you reach in a particular time uh, a synthesis right. where those two come really together. I think in yeah. the 20s it was probably Ray Hood. <laughs> yes, Ray absolutely. Hood with Rockefeller sure. Center and yep. uh, 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 in the Tripune Tower in Chicago, you know, uh, who kind of merged uh, 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 this, this optimal res relationship between uh, the, the, the architectural ideas and, and the economic necessities right. of the building. And I think it was actually Mies van der Rohe in the late 60s when he did many of those tall buildings uh, in Chicago, in Montreal, in New York, and where the aesthetic uh, preoccupations of an architect matched actually the technical and the economic necessities of a particular time. And I think that's probably what we're trying to do today, reestablish, I think, this relationship, which obviously got lost after there was a proliferation of uh, those kind of Miesian boxes, as we simplified call them, which spread over the urban landscape in America. That's right. Were you conscious, just a minor side question to get back to the Chrysler project, or the north of Chrysler project, uh, of the gray bar building across the street? Because I sense not in the splayed out top, but in the lower floors, a certain well, relationship in the massing to that. The, the, see, the, the program actually called for, for maximizing the lower floors. And uh, I think we were, we were real, uh, aware of the gray bar building and its somewhat symmetrical relationship to this building. I think there were other buildings like the GE building, which is down the street, you know, which yeah. has this massive base and which then steps back in, a, in an extremely kind of, you know, uh, uh, somewhat exuberant, complex right. way. So that very that, slender that, tower that, that has a crown slender, at the top. Slender tower yeah. to the top and it's a different top. I think New York is full of this kind of relationships. 
What we struggled actually more on the base is having 80% uh, of that base uh, on the street wall, as the Soaring Coast described, and not more than 20% back more than 10 feet from the, from the streetscape. And it is actually true that uh, on that building that uh, it was often a slide roll operation of actually uh, having a certain compliance uh, with, uh, with, the, with those code requirements, right. because that part of Lexington Avenue has a streetwide continuity. If you get up in the above 59th Street where Midtown ends, you, know, you, you can kind of do what you want. And, uh, and uh, uh, I guess it's necessary you know, to have certain prescriptions and, and in, in order to, at least it's felt right now that it is. And, but uh, I think it's definitely <coughs> going to cause a certain, um, uh, uh, it, it's going to limit, I think, you know, the possibilities what architecture actually can do because I, the, the, the zoning really in terms of street wall, in terms of setbacks, is, is, is definitely going to, to uh, limit the kind of variety of forms and shapes you, you can, can do in the city. That brings me to a broader question I'd wanted to ask you, which is you were at this point one of the most active and prominent architects in Chicago, in fact, whose name is at the, right now, I think, as closely associated with Chicago as that of any architect. Suddenly, though, you're doing an enormous amount of work in New York. Uh, Two-part question. Uh, to what do you attribute the fact that suddenly there's a great deal of interest in you and your firm in the city? here, and secondly, what are the differences right now between Chicago and New York? And I ask that question also in two parts, uh, both just as an observer, what do you see as the differences, and from a very fundamental standpoint, how different are they to work in as an architect? Well, uh, I think uh, ever since I came to this country, and I actually came here on Labor Day of 1966, you know, with a boat and... Uh, you said you came uh, intending to spend only a year, right? I came right? intending to stay one year here, and I ever liked New York. And, uh, and I think when we had a couple of years ago a chance to, building, to get a building in New York, I think uh, it was just somehow the, uh, uh, this additional challenge you know, of, of somehow really building in what I think can truly be considered the capital of the world, especially in terms of, uh, of, of, uh, of you know, the commercial building and commercial, commercial enterprise, uh, I think we did obviously our best you know, to obtain such a commission and uh, uh, I think we did it you know, f for reasons of, of just being part of a, of a kind of an architecture scene which uh, we considered important because there's been some revision in architectural history, you know, that uh, so the skyscraper was supposedly invented in Chicago and uh, there was the first and the second Chicago school. There was a lot of emission of those buildings in the 20s and 30s, which uh, probably had their more prolific expressions with buildings like Rockefeller Center, Empire State, and Chrysler Building in New York, and where we have probably few of them in Chicago. And it's obviously obvious you know, how this work actually has influenced recently what we are doing. So uh, we. we I really consider this kind of an additional challenge, and, and working here, actually, I find a difference. I mean, I find actually probably a readiness of the part of the clients we're working with here to probably reach a little bit higher than actually the people do in Chicago. And it probably comes underlying that Chicago is really probably a, a little bit more pragmatic. Uh, I think the opportunities are much smaller. I think. Uh, uh, none of those buildings we're actually doing in New York would be built in Chicago. They got footprints. Even now. Even now. They yeah. got footprints of 14,000 down to 12,000. Uh, uh, the, the, the city center building is 80 feet wide. It's, it's half on a side in mid-block. Uh, um, uh, you know, there's extreme limitations in, in, especially now with the new Midtown zoning which cuts down the area of the building compared to maybe what it was when they acquired the land. Right. Uh, I, I think also in turn it has actually, uh, some of the Chicago people seeing those buildings and actually liking them has in turn, I think, made it possible for us uh, to do things in Chicago which we wouldn't have been able to do a couple of years ago. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the last project I showed, uh, which is this project next to the civ Civic Center, which is that project with this dome uh, right. on top of those circular buildings merging out of a slab, is actually done for the same developer who is doing Illinois Center. And, um, oh, really? And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, uh, you probably don't know him, but you know, Paul knows him. And uh, Illinois Center is that accumulation of buildings uh, along the lakefront, you know, which uh, could be not called exactly inspired. It's not uh, Mises' finest it's, hour. It's kind no. of somewhat Mises at infinitum. And, uh, and, uh, sort of a bad Mies van der Rohe dream, actually. It's, it's done sort of still by the think. successors of the Miesian yeah. office, but, and they are perfectly fine buildings, but, but even those buildings have the minimum floor sizes are 25,000 square feet, but uh, they, uh, they actually step back and, uh, and they have some smaller floor sizes of about eight, 10,000 square feet on the top. And, uh, uh, actually, what we did, and uh, Paul, when you were last time in Chicago, I didn't have a chance to go up to, we moved in an old building, and actually we rented just the last couple of months, there's a dome on top of the building. And uh, we always have now our presentations up in that dome. And uh, so when they come up and say, this is just fantastic up there, and then when I get to my presentation, I says, you've got a space just like that on top of the building. And <laughs> it's so difficult for them to turn that down. <laughs> So you've now convinced all of your clients that they will have domes at the top? Well, we got about four of them right now with, uh, <laughs> with various versions of domes. Uh -huh. <laughs> the, uh, it seems, it, this is all interesting because I've always perceived your work as becoming, I mean, if we, if we, if we admittedly simplistically think of Chicago as representing the tradition of pragmatism and structural expression, and New York is representing a tradition of stage set exuberance, uh, flamboyance, theatricality, and so forth. Um, your work has gradually become less Chicago-like and more New York-like over the years, even before you were actually building in New York. But it still, I think, has the, the Chicago pragmatism. I mean, just uh, referring to this last project I just mentioned, uh, that uh, there's one of the preoccupations of this developers, of this particular developer, he's in joint venture with some other two, but he's really what we'd call the lead developer, uh, is that all the buildings he did have to be out of concrete, they have to, be a, have to have a 30 by 30 foot bay, they have to be on a five foot module, the curtain wall has to be two and a half feet out in front of the columns, and that, that building actually, yes. except for the curve, and right. a couple of modifications on the top, uh, totally complies to those kind of uh, criteria. Sure. But that, and, yeah. and I find myself you know, that, that even with the constraint and the limits of working within you know, these technical limitations, uh, that you can actually create a visual expression which uh, goes beyond what you normally would think uh, those limitations allow you to do. At the same time, we are able to uh, uh, impose that rationale on buildings like the Bank of Southwest or like the Philadelphia building, you know, where the requirements of height, actually, you know, the Bank of Southwest is 1,300 feet high and the Philadelphia building is about 1,000 feet high, that uh, where the requirements of uh, a rationale, especially in terms of the structure and its effects and on the structure, on the core, and on the systems of the building, the layout of the building, become a highly uh, important element where we actually uh, engage, and I myself engage very much in a, in a study of those relationships, uh, which is actually a factor of actually getting those buildings ultimately built. And, um, you know, the, the changes in plane, like on the Philadelphia building or on the Bank of Southwest, between the, the inner building and those corners relate to the core, relate to the structure. Um, you know, the, I, I think it's so, it, it's, it's the synthesis of those technical elements and those 
symbolic and visual elements and the formal elements which which actually makes uh, this study and this exercise and this practice of, uh, of planning, designing, and building those tall buildings really a truly rewarding one. And it's at that point, you know, where the, where the ring kind of closes between those early buildings and the last buildings, because it's not just, you know, and, and I don't want to mention any names, uh, putting, making a building look, you know, gothic or or, you can mention names. It's making all right. it uh, <laughs> look Art Deco. Uh, no, uh, we and, couldn't imagine what and, you'd be uh, thinking of anyway. Uh, so it's all right. And and but but where you kind of uh, uh, and none of these buildings are actually expensive buildings. Now, the Bank of Southwest is ninety dollars a square foot, and the Philadelphia building is seventy-five dollars a square foot. The, none of the buildings we built in Chicago is more than sixty dollars a square foot, and um, and uh, I, I think it's really. Uh, uh, only um, necess uh, only possible with an integration of this constructional uh, capabilities and necessities with the former ones. And this is actually what makes, for me, the practice of these tall buildings a rewarding one and an interesting one, because it does go beyond the surface. It goes really in the, in, 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 in a, in, in a, in, a in, in, what, in that what I call a synthesis you know, between very often diverging elements. Good. What um, building, well, well, before I actually ask that broader question, let me quickly ask about Bank of Southwest. Is that going to be built at this point? What's well, the outlook? Everybody knows about the condition of use and there's a lot of empty office space and uh, I, uh, it, it is uh, delayed right now. Uh, they have all the intention of building it, but I think it will be at least another year, or year and a half, uh, you know, before. Do they really think the Houston market will turn around that quickly? Well, I mean, it's a building which is going to take about three years to build, and yeah. uh, you know, I, I'm not in the, you know, uh, as architect, you really don't have any influence over it, and. Sure. Uh, um, uh, I obviously regret you know, that the, the building could be half finished right now. I think it's a, an important building. I think uh, due to its size, it's, uh, it's uh, obviously more important than a lot of the other ones. And you know, there is nothing like a tall building, you know, because anything from 20, 30 story on we consider a tall building, but it's probably no incident that there hasn't been actually any one of those real tall buildings built. Right. Uh, in uh, in recent uh, uh, time in history, and I think it shows uh, actually probably some of the problems of our society actually pulling off uh, buildings of that particular scale, because the time it takes to build those buildings, and the money it costs, and the money gets tied up uh, till those buildings can be occupied, is something which very few people can kind of afford. In New York, though, uh, the Park Avenue Tower is already under construction, right? Right. And mm -hmm. the Olympia New York building next to Chrysler, same thing? Is, so they're uh, in demolition of the site. It's demolition of the site, and uh, it, um, <coughs> you know, we're finishing the work in drawing, and it's a matter of a couple of months. No? Right. Okay. And what is the status of the tower next to city center? Well, we've been to landmarks you know, uh, twice, and the hearing has been closed, and um, they should mm -hmm. vote within. Uh, within, why, um, within a month. Can you explain, if, if I may interrupt, um, why does Landmarks have jurisdiction over it? Well, uh, this came up uh, uh, a lot in the hearings, and uh, you know, the, there's obviously a lot of uh, um, the, the, the relationship of new buildings to Landmark is obviously a very uh, touchy item in this I mean, city. city center is a uh, landmark, what makes, but this uh, is a separate what, what site. What makes this it? project different from a site like St. Bart's yeah. or the New York Historical Society that, you know, where the building demolishes part of a landmark or builds over a landmark, that the city center project is actually in its own site. It uses air rights, unused air rights from the landmark and in turn, it actually provides a new stage facility for the city center building on the footprint of the new development site. 
and it thus makes the city center theater, which was originally built as a fraternal meeting hall, really a legitimate music and dance facility, uh, and it lacks those facilities right now to be really a first-rate theater. So it, uh, it obviously is a commercial enterprise, uh, but it, it pays the, uh, a large amount of dollars to city center, including it makes it an operating facility. Uh, it actually complies uh, in essence to all the, 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 uh, the um, uh, new Midtown zoning regulations uh, and uh, it has to go before landmarks because of uh, uh, becoming a merged zoning lot uh, with, with, city ci with city center. I see. Yeah. And what is the outlook at this point, do you think? I think it's going to get built. Okay. <laughs> Um. What, what do you expect me to say? I go to. <laughs> do you I come here every week. <laughs> That's okay. That's answer, answer enough, I guess. Um, let's talk about something dramatically different, not only from the other projects we've been talking about, but from almost anything I know, which is the State of Illinois Center, the yeah. uh, state office building in the center of Chicago. Uh, can you talk about what you were doing there beyond the brief comment you made when the slide was on the screen? That's the lower building with an enormous atrium, splayed out walls, and a kind of truncated uh, abstraction of a dome yeah, on the it, top. It's, it's probably, even today, probably the most unusual building we've done. Uh, because I, I think, think it, that's fair to say. Uh, mm. uh, I think it. It, because it probably more than any of the other buildings uh, defies some of the norms of what you expect a building right. to do. And that's true in its forms, that's true in its colors, that's true in its spatial arrangement, and it's true it's in, urban, it, in its urban relationships. On and the other hand, in some very odd way, if you were to look at all of your buildings and ask someone to pick which one is a governmental office building and which are commercial buildings, in a funny way, you do sort of move to that one. But in a, I mean, the, the, the symbolism is very abstracted, but it isn't gone altogether. But be, because I think, uh, and this is a very good point, you know, and uh, I should probably have made that point when I presented it, but uh, this, you can never say all those things at one time about a building, and there's always these layers of meaning and importance about a building. But it was very much actually in our mind when we did the building that this was not a spec office building, mm -hmm. that it was actually a government building. And, uh, and uh, you know, working with state agencies and, and also the governor who was very much involved, we did a series of buildings and we finally narrowed it down to at the end really three, which was kind of a tall tower or as tall as the tower could be, which actually didn't make it a real tall tower because it's a whole city block. It's only 1.2 million square feet. And by zoning, you could build there about 4 million square feet. Uh, and we felt that the opportunities on the building really were uh, to, to create a, uh, to make gestures towards the city in terms of the experience you have walking around the building in through and in the building, uh, which were truly more uh, 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 you know, expanded somehow what a typical office building mm -hmm. can be. And for me, the, the, the most, uh, most direct uh, goal was actually the old federal building by Henry I. F. Cobbs, which was on the site where Mises Federal Center is right now, mm -hmm. which was a big square, about 20-story building, which a huge rotunda. Uh, and we actually had some designs which in a much more literal way, and uh, if you know some of the early sketches which have been published, <coughs> it shows kind of these ideas. And, and, and the building has from then on been abstracted. It has been modified to the urban conditions. The cut and the slice was opening the building towards the civic center and the city hall, the Dearborn corridor to create this governmental triangle. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about whether is destroys the feeling of the block of the building. The feeling of the block of the building is imaginary. It's not literal. It's reinforced by some elements on the ground floor, which you can see now much better since the, since the fences have come down. The, the top of the building, that slanted cylinder, is an obvious re reference to the dome of a building, and, and uh, the dome of a government building, and the large rotunda 
uh, you know, is, is highly ornamented, but it's ornamented out of the constructional uh, pieces, the structure, the walkways, the elevators, uh, and um, you know, it, 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 we spend a lot of time actually trying to get rid of the fireproofing there, uh -huh. uh, you know, which, which was actually the more important thing. Uh, uh, there's a lot of technical innovation in the building. It's probably one of the most energy efficient office buildings. It uses about 45,000 PDU per square foot per year. It has hardly uses any heat. It generates its own, it reuses its own heat. It has storage tanks which make water and ice. It has no uh, cooling towers. And uh, it has a curtain wall system, which at least at that time, especially for a government building, using silicon glazing, the large portion of the building, was uh, kind of a step of new technology. Which uh, uh, so it pushes, I think, the the interest in building not only on that symbolic level, but it uses, pushes the interest in the building on a formal level, on a technological level, and on a user level. And what I think actually is at the end. Uh, after the building all be finished and everybody gets used to it, it will be its most important tribute is actually what it gives back to the city, that it gives back a truly new type of urban space outside and inside the building. All very convincing, but I can't but ask, what about the turquoise panels on the facade? Well, uh, this, uh, I think it wouldn't be for those panels, people wouldn't be talking so much about the building. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think the, 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 the color is uh, obviously uh, some of the last element uh, which uh, somehow is uh, a break with this element of conventionality. Right. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, it's something uh, which I think a lot of you can have a lot of different feelings about it. I can understand that some people don't like it. Uh, there was times when I myself wondered about it. Uh, um, I think as the building comes together, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I feel stronger about it than I ever felt. Good, okay. Um, let me call for questions from all of you. Uh, please pass them to the ushers, and as we wait for them, we'll, we'll go on talking here. Uh, the Illinois Center, State of Illinois Center, that we've just been talking about seems, to me at least, to be, uh, when I look at it, I'm less amazed at the architecture itself as at the act of selling it to a client that's a state government, uh, given how governments are notoriously conservative, uh, even in Chicago where whatever else one might say about the political climate, there's at least a tradition of better civic architecture than there is in New York and most other places. Nonetheless, still, it seems like a remarkable achievement to have convinced a state government to build this building. Uh, then you've also convinced what may be the only worse kind of client than a government an airline to build a good airport building. Um, how did you do, do it each time? Uh, I mean, there's almost uh, no good architect, I guess, since Saren and built Dulles, who's done anything decent with an airport. Well, maybe we are somewhat lucky, but I, I, I think what, uh, uh, taking the two uh, in that sequence where you asked the question there, it was actually uh, the governor who had actually, so he wasn't physically a lot present, right. who actually had a lot to do, uh, that um, there was a lot of uh, importance instilled in the team uh, to take this assignment very serious. Mm -hmm. uh, and I still remember that uh, you know, the first meeting we had down in Springfield uh, when we assembled and you know, somewhat worked out the procedures, you know, that we, we got a call and said, the governor wants to see you. And uh, so the director of the capital development board, the project manager, myself, uh, and, uh, and uh, the project architect from our office saw the governor. And we saw him only for about five minutes. And he reiterated to us how important for him this project is. And uh, he reiterated, I think, essentially three points. And, and I probably won't quote it accurately. But it was one that he, 
He wanted the, the building to be an appropriate statement of the state in the city of Chicago. He, he wanted the building to, uh, to be a building of the future, as he called it, uh, uh, a building of the year 2000. And uh, he wanted the building to be uh, uh, something the people who worked in the building and the building, people who visited the building uh, to be cognizant of the importance of the building uh, as a government building. And I think it, it, it was that mandate which I sometimes had to maybe remind people of as we had presentations. And we carried for a while seven schemes. And then we narrowed it down to three schemes. We built big models. This, uh, I forgot what scale, uh, 16 scale models of those three schemes. And we actually finally had a meeting with the governor. And I was specifically instructed that I had to make it, and it was obviously at that point very clear what building we favored. One was a high rise, one was uh, the building which I ultimately built, and one was some other building in between, call it maybe a mid rise. And I was specifically instructed to be not pushy one way or the other. And we actually were asked to leave the, the, the uh, conference room when, this, when they made the deliberations. And um, the project manager of the state, which I had gone, gotten to know very well then by that point, which is probably an important thing to do in a project like this, uh, told me later that what happened actually in the meeting. And what happened in the meeting, uh, as soon as we left the office, uh, uh, the governor said uh, to his people, said, what do you want me to do? And uh, he said, you've got to pick one of those. And he says, what do I know? What one should I pick? <laughs> and they said, pick this one. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the rest now, is history. It's, it's probably, uh, I wasn't in the room, and, but that's the story I got. But in, in the meantime, actually, I just was at a luncheon uh, a couple of weeks ago from some convention in Chicago. And um, both the governor and I were at the program. And the governor talked for about half an hour about the building. He, he goes to the building every day. His old office is when he's in Chicago is across the street. He knows about every detail about the building. And he's very eloquent about it. And, and um, uh, you know, he's, uh, uh, I think it's, it's that uh, importance and the, the importance he attaches to this, which ultimately has kind of uh, uh, come through to the people we work with, so that after some rocky road, you know, you kind of go down sooner or later on every of these projects, you know, there is a sense that you have to actually accomplish it. And it's generally possible if, if everybody works together. On, on the United Terminal, um, again, there were some people in the city who really uh, and I think this had a lot to do that we got the job, not only that we did the airport originally, uh, which really picked us and, and wanted uh, you know, me to design that building. And um, it was at the end nobody else than Dick Ferris, who is the chairman of United <coughs> Airlines, mm -hmm. who, who made the decisions. And um, I just uh, remember the last presentation we had, and this is actually uh, just comes to my mind, and, but it's an indicative of that kind of process of how you get actually a building done, that I was told in staff meetings before, talking about the colors in the interior building, that they had the exact standards about hold rooms, what the carpet would be, and what the seats would be, and, uh, and that we had to strictly adhere it, because United Airlines had a policy that, that those uh, standards had to be strictly enforced in all the facilities throughout the country. So we built a model and uh, we tried to somewhat move town this awkward red carpet and those blue colors and this orange. And, and, uh, and so I made this presentation and, uh, and this was with Ferry sir, and uh, he says, well, what about the colors? Well, I said, you know, these are your colors. I said, uh, do you, do you, do you you, you, you seem to be so tentative about this color. So I said, do you like those colors? I said, feel free to tell me that you don't like those colors. I don't like those colors either. <laughs> I said, you can do whatever you want to do. And, 
I saw the people just in the back of the conference room about dropping down on the ground, you know. And uh, um, I think what ultimately I think uh, uh, is important is I think is that you that you do re establish a relationship with your client, and um, and which means <coughs> obviously that you spend a lot of time on those projects. Right. Uh, the design of a building is actually sometimes an easy thing, but making the building actually come out at the end that way is, 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 is actually the decisive thing. A good design isn't necessarily a good building, and I think it's a lot of the things I touched upon right. tonight, uh, and which I think you know, Paul alluding to in some of his questions, which actually makes a good building. And I think this is probably where some of us who are today in the forefront, I think, actually differ, is I think, uh, you know, the importance we actually kind of attach to a building following through, because image is one thing, but uh, the image only lasts as long. The images will change. Uh, the preferences for uh, certain aesthetic representations these buildings have will change. They have always changed throughout history. But I think one thing which will not change is that, that buildings have to uh, kind of grow out of particular uh, technical, functional, economic necessities of a particular time. Great. We have some wonderful questions. So let me turn to your questions instead of mine for the next few minutes. Um, would you design the same kind of high-tech skyscrapers for European cities, especially London, Paris, and Rome, where the historical vernacular is so much stronger than it is in the United States? Well, we actually done um, uh, last fall, and it's actually still going on, uh, a competition for uh, uh, Germany, uh, for Frankfurt, you know, which is probably of all the European cities, the most Americanized city. Uh, and I know we've been invited for that competition because of uh, uh, some people in Frankfurt uh, uh, wanting you know, to get uh, a building which goes beyond modernism, to put it in a kind of very simple way. And uh, uh, what, what we did in that particular design, you know, which is somewhat kind of an, uh, not a literal representation of an art deco building, but a somewhat a typical abstracted 20 skyscraper, uh, it's actually a group of two, uh, was a, a very, uh, very willful and very deliberate <coughs> effort to introduce kind of into Frankfurt, which has all those American skyscrapers which are built actually in a European tradition, meaning the Bauhaus tradition. The Bauhaus has been exported to America, re-imported to Frankfurt, you know, to, to, to actually import the one building type, which is actually typically American, which is actually a high-rise building. So um, yes, uh, you know, we actually felt that an, 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 a skyscraper in a European city, uh, in Frankfurt is probably one of the few European cities you can actually build. A skyscraper. Right. You can't build a skyscraper in the center of Paris. You can't build one in the center of Munich. You can't build one in London. You can't build one in Rome. Well, enough people uh, have. Uh, in London. In, well, London in the is. The city of London, certainly. Well, uh, it, it's yeah. really not. Uh, I mean, not in Mayfair or Belgravia, yeah. but yeah. Uh, th there's something I see in the city of London, and it's not low rise buildings. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's. it's uh, I mean, they're awful, but they're yeah, there. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I probably, you know, I can only talk really about, uh, right. about what I've done. I mean, right. I'd rather talk right. about that particular experience in Frankfurt, sure. you know, which sure. might be modified as you do something in right. London. Uh, uh, you know, buildings grow out really, out of, uh, you know, at, at, at a particular situation. And, um, and uh, I think you have to take them at a case-by-case -case basis. Sure, absolutely. Um, your mention of Frankfurt makes me want to jump ahead to this question. How do you feel about architects like Richard Meyer getting large commissions in your homeland? 
Well, I, th I think Richard Meyer got invited uh, to that competition for the same reason we got invited to the competition. And uh, 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 I, uh, I think it's a very good thing. I think it's done a lot to raise the level of uh, perception about architecture in Frankfurt and in Germany in particular. I think they actually needed it. Good. Two uh, somewhat related questions, so I'll ask them together. Uh, Let me you, just say, yeah, please, you know, please. See, architects are actually very protected, protective about their own turf. Now, it is probably true that the ones who who are somewhat no more uh, known, no, they, they don't have this problem. Uh, but uh, architects are actually often the worst enemies, you know, by trying to actually keep people out. There's a lot of movement now, and actually that's part of the reason why that competition we've been involved, why it's been dragging on, because the, 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 there's clearly always a realization at one point, what's the best design, but somehow they, they try to kind of strike some political deal, put two guys together, make a joint venture, right. split up the job so that the local guys don't keep stop crying. You know, I mean, they did the same thing in Stuttgart, you know, where Sterling built one, regardless on what side of the architectural philosophy you stand, built one of the most interesting and striking museums which have been built. Now, you as an architect don't really have to uh, uh, totally subscribe to it. You don't have to, you, you don't have to uh, uh, agree with it. I mean, the fact actually that somebody makes a statement of, of that importance, uh, regardless of their own philosophy, is I think actually something you have to admire. And, uh, and I think, you know, even today, you know, after all these years of controversy, there's absolutely not any the slightest doubt. You know, those, those buildings like Sterling did in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Stuttgart or Holland did in Mönchengladbach or or Maya is doing, or Angers did in, in Frankfurt, you know, uh, are really, I think, the buildings which are going to be remembered, you know. And, sure. uh, and I think that's ultimately good for the profession at large, because I think it raises the standards, it puts the next guy who builds a building up against matching those standards. And uh, I think it's going to improve what we all can do as a profession, and I think, you know, the. Uh, the the world I think is big enough to 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 take all those different people doing different jobs in different places. Great. Do you ever accept commissions for small scale projects, like houses, furniture, china, and if so, last week Richard Meyer talked a little bit about his bowls and glasses. Um, what materials would you use? And then a related question. The projects you've shown tonight are all large government or corporate buildings. Is there something so fundamental to your work that inhibits you from designing on an intimate scale? Are you more concerned philosophically with the public rather than the individual or private public, i.e. residents or museum projects, and that sort of spaces? If so, why? Well, uh, there's a so lot of questions. Let me try yeah. to take them one by one. Uh, Part of the answer is uh, you do the jobs you get, uh, I suppose. Uh, uh, I, I done one house and I designed another one. Uh, some of you, it was published uh, house and a garden, couple of right? times. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Architecture Digest in the right, right. journal. And uh, uh, it was done for a former partner of mine. And uh, I did it because, uh, uh, you know, the guy really asked me and I had some other agreement that I could do what I wanted to do. Uh, you know, he, by the way, also likes the house, and uh, and uh, I think it was uh, a very interesting project. So it it it's something with the volume of work we're doing right now is not compatible with the practice, and you know, I've subsequently, you know, just not even jumped on any inquiries about my availability of doing houses. I think you got to kind of know what your limits are and what you have to spend your time on. Uh, I, I don't do houses because I don't consider them important, but uh, as you can see from the type and volume of work we do, it's just not the right thing to do because to take houses serious is just as difficult and uh, important and time consuming as doing an office building. Um, um, the, the work we're doing you know, is, is obviously larger scale. It's not only corporate and governmental, it's, uh, 
it's um, it's it's actually a lot you know de developer work. Uh, uh, it's uh, it so it 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 responds to kind of a larger scale. I think it comes down actually still to a level of the individual human being. Uh, you know, so in the interest of time of presenting buildings, it's just very hard to talk about it. But even in the state of Illinois Center, as you get to your workplace, I think you you have the same intimate relationship to your surroundings as you do have in a 10 or 20 or 50,000 square foot office building. I think the, there's a much grander uh, progression and in a in a, in a kind of a movement as you arrive on it, which. I think is appropriate to a governmental building. It is less dramatic in in a in a in a, in a spec office building, uh, uh, but I think the 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 areas of concern are really uh, actually the same. Now I haven't uh, the other question. I, I've been approached to designing furniture and uh, uh, related things. I've done a <coughs> few of the things like that color core competition and so. But I've I, I've actually not accepted any commission to do that because I must say that, quite frankly say that at this point in time, I'm probably not interested in it. Uh, I, I can't get my mind focused on it. I, I, I probably just too busy to barely control the thing I have to do and uh, I, I tend to think that there's probably a time when, when you are ready for it, uh, but I, I, I I, I can only do the things I'm, 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 right. I'm interested in. I, I, at this point, yes, I probably consider the other things more important. I think there's probably a certain sense of exploitation today about having architects doing those things. I don't think that's not uh, what architects can do best. Uh, I think there, there are other people who probably are more apt to do that because once architects really end up doing those things, then, uh, then they're actually not architects anymore. Uh, uh, it's... Um, On the other hand, well, I don't know, was, was Richardson or Stanford White Less an arch or Frank Lloyd Wright, less an architect for well, doing I a whole range see, of see, things you, you, from you one to the other. You can't look back. What an architect used to be at that particular time is different. Yeah. From what you do today. I mean, you know, uh, all of us who you know, you know, in you know, the firms who kind of do similar work like us, we all I think work on a different scale today. You know, and and uh, those buildings are done actually very quick. Uh, you can't just take one or pick one or two and then turn the other ones away. Uh, Sure. Uh, uh, well, I it's, can it's see, uh, I don't know, I can see your argument from a, a, certainly I can see it from a personal standpoint of just saying you're not interested, which is valid. I can also see it from a standpoint of cost effectiveness, that just your time cannot be devoted to the detail and uh, that designing an, an object would take. On the other hand, what doesn't convince me is the argument that somehow by doing that one is less an architect and that one can encompass the whole range, I would think. Can one not? Well, I mean, as long as you didn't decide that was all you were interested in doing, then, you were not, then you're not an architect, that's true. But if, is it any different from saying that, you know, I mean, if a developer idea. came to you and said, I have, oops, I have, I want you to do a building so special that I don't want to use standard fittings. I want you to design every doorknob, every faucet in every sink, in every restroom here. Would I you, just think it's what an impossible say? thing to do. Yeah. I actually okay. do, I really do think. Uh, I remember Jack Brownson when he did the Civic Center. He, mm -hmm. he literally designed everything. Now that was in the early 60s when that building was designed. And, uh, and actually, uh, Jack Brownson has actually done afterwards never a building again. I don't, you know, and, and I think uh, he, it, as, as some of us who knew him close, it really got to him because I think the sense of control he wanted to have about yeah. the building. When we did McCormick Place, you know, Gene Summers was that time the, you know, the design partner in the firm. We actually did a lot of special things. We designed light fixtures. We, 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 we tried to get the light switches in the right place. We tried to make panels where all the 
this uh, apparatus like thermostats and drinking fountains and all were connected. Uh, we, we just learned at the end actually successful. And after we actually were limited successful in the building, as the client moved in the building and as some pressures of the marketplace in terms of exhibition space, they made. And the building was all that uh, to a point where it wasn't even legible anymore, but in some areas the intent was. I yeah. think that uh, you know, th th there's a, a line uh, in a way I think this element of control in the building uh, is, is actually not possible anymore. Yeah. And, um, and um, uh, <coughs> I, I must say today that you know, we did some buildings where we did the interiors, especially governmental buildings in, in, uh, 10 years ago. And um, they never actually got all the furniture in the right place before people started to move things out. They didn't like that they moved in their old thing. Right. Uh, I think it's an, in certain corporate headquarters, and we haven't actually been fortunate doing this kind of jobs, uh, where it is possible. I, I, uh, another question, I think I'd like to do some of the special jobs. I mean, I actually, you know, and I think some of the buildings like United and, and we're doing some, you know, like uh, I didn't show a slide, like the subway station we're doing. An, Oh, yeah, elevated I love that subway station. Elevated it's station wonderful. right now in Chicago. Yeah. This is actually the jobs which interest me very much. You, know, you can't always pick them. <coughs> and um, and um, it's, um, th there's an element of repetition in, in those uh, buildings. I mean, you get actually used right. as an architect to be partially uh, as a marketing tool, as somebody who packages sure. those buildings. As the architects who design teapots gets used because of the name to sell teapots. You know, and, uh, and to some degree, it's actually the same thing. And, uh, and uh, sure. uh, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, fortunately, architecture is right now very much in the public mind. And uh, I think it's good for architects and architecture. Yeah. Yeah, right. I'm glad you mentioned the subway station, because that's, I think that's a wonderful thing. It's the new subway station at O'Hare Airport. Uh, and that's a, re by the standards of what you usually do, that is a small-scale project. It's just a one single, moderate-sized subway station, yeah. and it's wonderful. Yeah. And well, it, it offered actually, you know, that the certain. It's it's an underground station. It's underneath an existing parking garage, and it was built in an open cut with a tunnel, and we used the possibility of the open cut to backlit the walls, which are of glass block in different colors. And, and sort of undulating, right? And yeah. uh, the acoustical consultant said at the end it was impossible and said, well, how about curving the walls? And, uh, and uh, so it's, it's the typical uh, condition again where ultimately what you do... But that is, makes it formally more interesting. So it kind of <laughs> comes out actually yeah. of solving the real requirement. Mm -hmm. We would actually probably not come up with the idea of curving right. it. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, architect, this is a, a good example of, of, uh, of, of, of the, where the limitations of the project actually were, let ultimately do its, its strongest point, that it was underground, right. that it was built as a cut, uh, uh, you know, which, which made this stru uh, structure massive scale, a huge transfer girders, 10 feet high, 60, 80 feet wide, transferring this parking garage. If you build it new, you, 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 you couldn't justify that kind of structure. Right. So there, uh, you couldn't actually justify that height because it would have been much lower because you mm -hmm. would have just built whatever you needed. But there was nothing to put above because there was a building right. above and the building was so far above where the train had to come in. Yeah. And, and this is, I think, where architecture gets actually the strongest, uh, where, where you meet those necessities of the program <coughs> and the functional conditions and where you elevated the solution which you use in achieving those goals you know, to a level where uh, the pragmatic aspect gets transformed into something which is almost ideal, you know, where, where, where a certain technical aspects, you know, they, 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 they actually start making form and uh, where uh, certain you know, uh, commercial necessities uh, start actually making a lot of intellectual sense. And where you transfer from, from those meanings, for, 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 from those realities which you have to deal in a job, to those irrational and intuitive aspects which make architecture just true art. Okay. I'm going to give you a 
question from somebody who was unconvinced by one of your descriptions of one of your jobs. Uh, 425 Lexington appears to be trying to be a star beside the moon. It's the building next to the Chrysler building. It screams its individuality. Why didn't you design a more graceful neighbor for the Chrysler building? What are you trying to prove by ignoring context? The result is a killjoy. Do you really feel you are ignoring context? You know, it, it's... Uh, I, like I said before on the state building, I, I don't think those buildings are made to make everybody agree. And uh, I'm not really out uh, trying to convince everybody that they have to like all those buildings. You know, so I think it's nice to hear some applause. I mean, we all uh, like the applause better than the booze. Uh, I, I think, you know, what we really, the period of architecture we are really right now, you know, call it a certain pluralism and a certain right, diversity, right. Uh, uh, something more than kind of one style, is the natural reaction against modernism. And, and I think that at least for me, you know, justifies uh, you know, those different approaches. Uh, nobody has ever sufficiently explained to me what urban context is because it's probably the most misused word in it's, architecture. I think it's all too often used to um, mean imitation, which no is not. No imitation. I know what it is. Right. Build a building like the building next to it. Uh, right. You know, uh, uh, I, I, you know, it's a problem of scale. You know, it's a problem of that an office building is something totally different today. The Chrysler building has probably 2,000 square foot floors, you know, as you get up to the top. You know, you, 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 that, that, uh, for anybody who knows that building type today, knows the realities, uh, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, the top of the Philadelphia building is, is about four times as big, you know, and, and uh, if yeah. you put the two buildings together, you'd never think they're actually the same. And that, yeah, it, the thing is probably clunky against the Chrysler building. So yeah. I think it's, it's, it's just an effort of dealing with these requirements of our time in a, in a new way. And uh, you know, f 10 years ago, what would you have done? You know, to put another Seacrams building there. You know, and and uh, 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 too many Seacrams buildings don't make actually the Seacrams building look worse. And that's what the situation we are in right now, nobody pretends that we got uh, the right answer. I don't think anybody has achieved that kind of uh, synthesis and, and uh, that uh, response you know, to, to, the, to the conditions of a time like Mies has. Uh, but if Mies would be alive today, I don't think he would be doing the same buildings anymore, but, but his followers who, who mindlessly adhere to his principles, they still, right. uh, they still actually push those, uh, those principles further. And I think it's the creative mind, and I think Mies in that case would be a creative mind who would have questioned, I think, that continued principles. Because <coughs> when he did those buildings, those buildings were really isolated cases in the urban fabrics. But those buildings have actually become a norm. And we know that as uh, Sixth Avenue, uh, Avenue of the Americas shows, or Illinois Center shows in Chicago, or whole cities like Houston and Dallas show, that those buildings don't make a city. And, and what we wrestle today is trying to modify that building type, you know, uh, you know, to make a more urban contextual relationship, not in a literal way, but in a way of actually adhering to principles which have been traditionally urban. You know, that the street, the arcades, uh, spaces in the, in the urban fabric. I think it's so scores which we have not yet probably successfully realized in those uh, new buildings and in, in, in our cities. And uh, I, I think it's, uh, that this is what I see uh, right now right. Is, is, is our primary goals. And um, uh, I see, I think, uh, aspects of the building we're doing on Lexington Avenue or Park Tower, 
with the plazas and the ar arcades you go through the building or at city center with a through block connection. I think it's probably sometimes a very modest effort, but as, as, a, as a maxim, as an optimization of, of what you can do actually to tie the buildings into what is more than the traditional fabric in the city. The lobby of, of 425 Lexington is actually very much in scale like what the Chrysler building. It's actually very small. It's contained by space around. You can go in the front, you can go in the side. You can go through it if security allows you, which it hardly does anymore on those buildings. There's a lot of obstacles we have today in doing those buildings, which actually don't allow you to do that anymore. You can't actually, a, an office building isn't an urban building anymore. It is sometimes uh, a, fortress, uh, really. a, a fortress. It's a hermetically mm -hmm. sealed off building you know, from the urban fabric, especially the higher priced ones, especially in the higher rent districts, because security is a very important thing. Uh, on, 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 on people's mind, on tenants' mind, and it's, it's something just like the architecture which is used in marketing of those buildings. That's actually a, a, an irony that we had not thought of before, because at a moment when architecture, large-scale commercial architecture is moving toward more public space in terms of arcades and covered plazas and so forth, the client's demands, so far as security is concerned, are going in the opposite direction. Yeah, we lost right. our peers in front of, yeah. uh, as you know. Uh, I know, which is really too bad. That screen wall, I really like a lot. Because yeah. uh, we, that building has a plaza on 55th Street uh, for obvious reasons of uh, getting a, 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 you know, the new Midtown zoning, the only, only bonusable uh, uh, FAR. And, um, and the irony is actually, you know, we had originally tried to continue the street wall had you know, fragments of what you would call a, 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 a screen, columns and beams to, to continue this, the street one. There were two obstacles. One was actually that the zoning code specifically doesn't allow you any obstructions. And in order to actually do that, you had to go in what is called an as of rights building uh, to city planning and get a special permit, which is about a one year process and uh, very time consuming and expensive. That together that the developer actually felt that those elements actually cause an, an aspect of insecurity, you know, that they, they allow people to hide and, uh, and uh, I'm sure it isn't just makeup, I mean it's, it's, it's true, those things were about five, six feet wide, uh, you know, that, that, that aspect of overcome the zoning difficulty, the aspect of being an impediment to the security of the building made it ultimately for us impossible to argue, to continue to argue for those elements, you know, besides obviously from the cost, you know, which, which is probably was actually infinitesimally small uh, compared to the other ones. So, so architecture, this is probably a point in a very, uh, uh, an, an aspect where architecture is actually somehow, you know, uh, a response to certain social condition that, that our life is actually you know, it's been very difficult that, that, right. that security is today, you know, uh, something which makes us hermetically seal off as often as we can from the environment is actually kind of totally counterproductive to what we all romantically and, uh, and uh, kind of aspire to is somewhat the, the Arcadian city, you know, the, the, the beautiful place, you know, full of fountains and trees and sunshine, where you can sit there, and, uh, and you know, all those drawings uh, Leon Greer makes, you know, they, 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 that's a fantasy. It's, uh, you know, but it, it's, uh, and it's not that we're not trying to achieve this, and this is not that it isn't a goal, but if, if you really work in that world, it's something you know, which, uh, which you actually, as an architect, uh, get, uh, you know, get d disappointed on what the ultimate results can, can bear in terms of achieving these goals. That actually gives me a good lead into what I think, because of time, will have to be our final question. And I say that with regret, because actually tonight there's an unusually good stack of questions that time doesn't allow us to get to. After all you've said about construction and so forth, would you say that the end result of your design is, is a romantic one? And if not, why not? Well, I mean, one of the, 
self uh, phrased uh, descriptions about uh, our project, uh, and I'm sure you have read about it, is, is, uh, is the phrase romantic high tech. You know, and uh, I, I very much actually subscribe uh, to that characterization. I think it's very much of our mind. I think it's a, it's a way of accepting that the necessities of technology and construction, but in merging it with uh, those ideals which deal with the spiritual and with the human uh, aspects of, of a building uh, or with, of, of cities. And um, I think it's the tension sometimes which is uh, generated by the way we mean, uh, we, we, we use forms and the way we treat those forms the way we use materials, the way we use colors, it's, uh, it's how those uh, associations get evoked. And uh, I think it's, 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 uh, it's a way of dealing somewhat with what could be called, you know, uh, as we've been talking about tonight, uh, uh, certain limiting possibilities of achieving a merger between the technical uh, aspects of our society and the spiritual aspects of our mm -hmm. society, uh, which is actually something which architecture are always tempted to do and um, which I don't actually think modernism never achieved. I mean, I think that's something Mies wanted to do. And uh, it is actually one of the inherent beliefs in modernism, that modernists believe mm -hmm. that, uh, that uh, a clean architecture uh, mm. uh, uh, was well, actually going to rid a society of all the human and social ills, and uh, that actually didn't happen. And um, mm. I tend to always think that uh, partially actually what happened that, uh, um, that those early modern masters actually were actually uh, more inventors and innovators. They were actually probably more daring than we were right now. Because when Mies built those glass houses, he actually didn't let his architectural vision stop uh, uh, before in, in, uh, in front of those uh, uh, technical and constructional limitations. He actually built those glass houses without air conditioning. Uh, and, uh, and to some degree, actually, that, that actually created uh, that aversion and that negative sense about, uh, about those glass houses, which were beautiful, but which you couldn't live in. So the, the very purpose you know, of that architecture wasn't actually totally fulfilled. And this is why these modern masters were actually heroes. You know, they, they were much more heroes than we actually are today, because we actually have the know-how today to do those buildings technically right. Uh, we have a certain vision, and as such, actually, we have actually an easier time. But I think it's a time to be mindful of you know, that the true innovators actually were those modern masters and not us. There's no better note, I think, on which to end um, than that, since I think it, it pulls it all together in, in a way that come, brings me back to a phrase that I've used and I think others have used a lot, which is, can, characterizing this time as not as postmodern but as romantic modern in that I think what we're really doing is not turning away from the modernist, modernist tradition but uniting it with the romantic tradition and declaring that they really need not be contradictory which I think is what what you're saying well yeah, I think that from what uh, we've been saying or I've been saying yeah. tonight that that's obviously I think uh, after everybody sooner or later has been kind of categorized and put in a slot in a drawer. You know, we all refuse those labels today. Uh, and uh, Paul Gap, who is the architectural critic uh, uh, of the Chicago Tribune, he, uh, he, he, he used to, he, since years, he keeps calling me a radical postmodernist. And uh, after writing about on Monday morning, you know, ten letters and always disavowing you know, that kind of categorization. Mm -hmm. I actually finally gave up, you know, because he still calls me that way, and I don't. I think can't comment I, on uh, other <laughs> architecture. I, I think I'm actually the least that way, and right. uh, and um, uh, uh, 
I, I actually think that, uh, you know, after, uh, after a time <coughs> where some of the positioning within a certain intellectual rigor in terms of a development of a style for one or all or each of us was kind of important. The, the good thing about this particular time is actually that uh, we focus our attention really, again, much more on buildings. Right. And um, because I think it's ultimately the buildings which will speak, uh, I think uh, the, the economy has fortunately been this way that, that all the people, uh, there's a, uh, a lot of people who used to teach and talk they build today, and I think that has actually tremendously softened their stance and their position. Uh, and uh, just wait till what Richard Meyer is going to do when I get him to see him. <laughs> and and uh, it has also done the opposite, that it has made uh, you know, larger commercial offices, and you know, I, I don't think it's actually a bad thing to say, you know, somebody likes Kid Morris in America, right. much more attuned to uh, to uh, to looking at the validity of that questioning of those uh, modern principles, and I, I think there's actually very little difference today. There's an acceptance, you know, that um, that there are, is more than one way of doing it. I think you could call it a confusion. I, I don't think there are any answers right now, but there's definitely a lot of room for exploration. Uh, there is a lot of readiness to accept that. Uh, I don't think it's dangerous in, in the way, any more dangerous than it always has been. Uh, as we all know, buildings are there for a long time and uh, mistakes maybe are visible for longer than we want to. Uh, but. Um, I think this is what makes the time exciting, and um, it uh, makes it fun to be an architect. Wonderful. You've been eloquent, and I can't add anything except I certainly agree with the last point. Helmut, thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. Please join me in saying thank you. I hope you'll all join us next week when Michael Graves will be with us. <laughs>